Hi everyone, good to be back with you. We are in Romans 1, 1 to 7 this week. And you know, earlier this week I was reading an article from Forbes. And in the article it gave some statistics about the impact that first impressions can have on the ongoing health of a relationship between people. And I want to share some of those with you before we get into our text this week. Here's the first one. It takes approximately seven seconds for a person to form an impression of somebody they meet. The first time they meet them, seven seconds, such a short time. Uh, it also said that research indicates that within the first 30 seconds to two minutes, people make judgments about others that are often enduring. And that's true even when you watch a video like this within the first five to 10 seconds, you're deciding whether or not you are going to keep watching or you're going to switch off. If you're still with me, even now, well done. In another research journal, uh, I read that approximately one-third of bosses know within the first 90 seconds of an interview whether or not they are going to hire somebody. Uh, so if you go for a job interview, make sure you make a good impression in those first 90 seconds, in the first minute and a half. Um, there's a website, Match.com, relationship website. They did some research on how first impressions then impact the bias with which we look at individuals. And they coined two different phrases to describe how this works. The first one was what they called the halo effect. And the theory goes that if someone makes a good impression on us initially in those first seven seconds or 30 seconds to two minutes, uh, we're likely to attribute positive qualities to them in our minds not because they've done anything to prove that they have those qualities but if they just make that good first impression on us we assume good things about them and that intensifies the favorable impression that we have of them that's why it's called the halo effect uh, good first impression we almost see them as an angel and think of them as an angel uh, the reverse is also true. There is something that they call the horn effect. I assume that is to do with uh, the devil. Uh, and that is when someone makes a bad impression on us. Initially, we assume negative attributes to them in our minds. Again, not because they've done anything to show us that um, they're a bad person necessarily, but if they make a bad first impression, uh, we have an increasingly unfavorable perception of them as we attribute these negative views towards them. So first impressions count for so much in terms of how a relationship is going to develop. They can make or break a relationship. Now, as we think about uh, our series in the book of Romans and Paul's letter to the church at Rome, and as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, remember that he's writing to them without having a prior relationship with them. Paul didn't plant a church at Rome. He planted many others, but not that one. And he's hoping to go there and to speak into the issues of disunity between Jews and Gentiles who were at the church in Rome. But he's writing this letter beforehand. And so what he's writing to them is going to form their initial impression of Paul. And if his letter as a whole is going to form their initial impression of him, how much more the first few lines, the first paragraph of his letter that might make or break whether they read the rest of it. Remember, people form their first impression of you quickly, in seconds. So what Paul says at the start of his letter to the people in Rome matters so much. Remember a time in your life when you were writing to someone to make an initial connection. Um, it might be a letter, it might be an email, it might be a text, or uh, if it was lately, it might have been a voice note on WhatsApp. And think about that time. Did you have the experience of starting to write something or type something or text something or click that button and record the voice note, and then all of a sudden you've stopped, you've thought again, you've pressed delete, and you've started again? And you've repeated that process so many times and you've maybe even read back or listened back to what you said before you finally sent it. I've done that. I've done it so many times. And we do that because uh, as we write, as we record, we're putting ourselves in the shoes of the person who's receiving our communication and we're thinking about the impression what we're saying is going to form, uh, what, what impression is going to be formed in their minds of us based on our first few words. And we're keen to make sure that they know what we're like 
truly and um, what our heart is from the start. And as I think of the Apostle Paul, who uh, likely sat there and dictated his letter for somebody else to write down, I just picture him thinking over it very carefully about what he's going to say and how he's going to say it and putting himself in the shoes of the people at Rome when they first receive his letter and unravel the scroll and open it and begin reading. Uh, possibly, maybe, Paul started and then he stopped and he said, scrap that, erase it, get a, another piece of papyrus out, we're going we're gonna to start again. You know, thinking through, what do I want these people to know about me right from the get-go? And we have to ask, what is it that Paul lands on? What does he decide to tell them about himself in his opening lines? That's what we're going to look at today. Let's read through them together. And then I'm going to sum up the one theme that Paul seems to have chosen to major on in his introduction to the church at Rome. So uh, grab your Bibles. And we're in Romans chapter 1, 1 to 7. And Paul says this at the start of his letter. He says, Paul. He's introducing himself. That's what they did in those days, by the way. They didn't uh, say, dear whoever, and start with the person they're writing to. They'd begun with who they were. So you knew from the start who the letter was from. So Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who were called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those who were in Rome, who were loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are various elements to that introduction. Like most of Paul's letters, it's very dense, it's very rich, but there is a theme which holds it all together. And that theme is Paul's apostleship. Paul speaks about his calling to be an apostle in verse 1, and then he links it to being set apart for the gospel. And then he gives a condensed summary of the gospel in verses 2 to verse 4, before explaining in verse 5 that it is the risen Lord Jesus who the gospel is about that is that is the source of Paul's apostleship. Then at the end of verse 5 and into verse 6, Paul explains the goal of his apostleship. We'll come on to that in another session. Uh, before greeting the church at Rome with the grace and peace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you might be wondering, as we talk about apostleship, what do the words apostle and apostleship mean? Now, the simplest way to explain that is to tell you that the original word in the Greek language for apostle means sent one, sent one. An apostle is one who is sent by God to the people in order to labour for God's kingdom to be established. The apostles in the Bible were the first men entrusted with the preaching of the gospel after Pentecost, and they went on mission to proclaim the gospel, to see the name of Jesus established in unreached places and to plant Christian communities there, which we know as churches. Eventually, appointing elders over those churches for those churches to run autonomously. They did that all around modern day Israel, Greece, Turkey and Macedonia. In Ephesians 2.20, the Bible says that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, but first it mentions the apostles. In Ephesians 4, it, say, it says that God gave apostles amongst other officers in the church, uh, other roles in the church, to build up the church to maturity and to help the church be anchored in sound doctrine so that they could become like Christ. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul explains that the gift of apostleship is the highest of all spiritual gifts higher than the prophetic, higher than the miraculous, uh, higher than the pastor or the teacher, is the apostle. Importantly, he says not all are called to be apostles, but we should eagerly desire the higher gifts, and within that is included apostleship. So whilst there was a uniqueness 
to the apostles in the Bible in terms of their authority to establish scripture, we do have those with apostolic gifting in the church today. God hasn't done away with that gifting, it still exists. In Paul's day, many claimed to be apostles who weren't. That was an ongoing issue that Paul had to deal with, especially at Corinth. And friends, that's still an issue today. One issue Paul faced a few years later before writing, um, a, f a few years earlier before he wrote to the church at Rome, was people at Corinth claiming that he was a false apostle. And so Paul had to explain very carefully why the fruit of his life and his ministry demonstrated that his apostleship was genuine. So you can see why when he then comes to write to the church at Rome a few years later after that issue at Corinth, making his first connection with, with Rome, Paul decides that as a first priority, he's going to lay out his apostleship from the start. And what I'm going to do over the coming month with the help of others in our church is cover the key points that Paul wants us to know about his apostleship from verse 1 to verse 7, which I read to you earlier. We're going to start this week, but we're going to be doing the bulk of this teaching at our church weekend away, which I'm really excited for. And I'm going to call this mini series within the book of Romans being apostolic. And it's a fantastic subject for us to look at together. In total, we're going to look at four marks of what makes a person truly apostolic. Uh, however, I want to set out the expectation from the start. And the expectation is not that we're all going to become apostles. The reality is the vast majority of us are not going to serve in that capacity, in that office, within the Church of Christ. As an office in the Church, apostleship, the calling to be an apostle, is a role of leadership that's meant for the few who are called to it and gifted by God's grace to do it. However, as a church, and this is why it's important for us, I believe with all my heart that for us at Gateway, we have an apostolic calling together as a church, as a group of people, as a body. And what I mean by that is that we're called to work together to establish the gospel and the church in places that are currently unreached. And to do that, we have to seek to have an apostolic mindset. I believe that we're called to be apostolic for a number of reasons, but primarily because of the prophetic guidance and trajectory that God has led us on as a, as a community, as a church over the years. And what we're doing now in seeking to plant and to multiply expressions of church in unreached places is apostolic in nature. And we have growing connections as well with overseas ministries in places around the world that are very hard to reach, uh, where people are doing apostolic work. But of course, our main bread and butter is closer to home. And whilst we don't often think of the UK in this way, the UK is now firmly an unreached place for the gospel. We are generations into people being biblically illiterate, not knowing who Jesus is, not knowing what the gospel is, without hope and without God in the world. Um, I recently wrote a, an academic work on the uh, secularisation of the UK over the 20th century. And I can tell you that while secularity took hold in a strong way, in the UK in the 1960s, the ousting of Christianity from public life, especially in the UK, has been brewing for over 120 years. And we're now in a place where only a small percentage of people in the UK are truly following Christ. It was a slow, gradual decline until the 1960s. And then there was this rupture in the 60s where many laws were passed that were a complete affront to the gospel, a complete affront to righteousness. And since then, there's been a rapid casting off of the Christian faith and upstanding morality in general, a, a, an embracing of, of lawlessness and immorality in a very public way. So we're in a mission field and we need to think like missionaries. We need to stop thinking like that we exist in a nation that's in the midst of Christendom because we're not. Christendom is dead and we need to think of ourselves as missionaries, but not only missionally, we need to think of ourselves apostolically. We are praying and we are working for the establishment of the kingdom of God through the church in our nation. And that requires an apostolic movement. 
comprising of people who, even if they're not functioning in the role of an apostle themselves, are thinking and behaving apostolically. So this week, I'm going to explain the first element of being apostolic that Paul lays out in Romans 1, 1 to 7, and then we'll cover more on our weekend away. And the first element has to do with servanthood. It might not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the apostolic. Uh, maybe you think of miracles or something else, but the first thing is to do with servanthood. Paul begins by introducing himself as Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Now look at that carefully. Notice that Paul's description of himself as a servant comes before his designation as an apostle. Now that is important because the existence of servanthood in your life is what qualifies you for any office in the church. Whether it's an apostle or anything else, servanthood is what qualifies you. Servanthood in your family, servanthood amongst the body of Christ. So even more so in those offices, uh, like the office of apostle, which Paul cites as being the higher offices. And by extension, if we're thinking of apostleship from a corporate perspective, from a whole church perspective, in terms of our calling, our willingness as a church to be servants of God and our Lord Jesus Christ is what qualifies us as a church to embrace an apostolic calling and ministry. It's important that we think that way. Do you see that Paul says he is called to be an apostle? That was a unique assignment that God gave to him. However, being a servant is something which Paul describes as being part of himself, part of his identity. It's something that he is. I'm Paul, a servant who then is called to the assignment of being an apostle. In that sense, Paul sees servanthood as not optional, but part of the nature of being a follower of Jesus. And that's how we should think of ourselves, as ones who are servants of God and servants of people. Because the head of the church, which is not me, and it's not some famous Protestant preacher, and it's not the Pope, it's our Lord Jesus Christ, he was the ultimate servant who laid down his life for us. And our new life is now to live in him and to imitate him. Do you remember uh, the narrative in Luke 22, 24 to 27, where Jesus' disciples were arguing amongst themselves over who was the greatest? And Jesus responded to them by describing how leadership works amongst the rulers of the world, amongst those who have high positions who don't follow him. He says to them, just look at these ones in the world who are, who are not of God, but are of the world. In our day, they would be the CEOs, the executives, the business people. They would be the presidents and prime ministers and the kings and the, the dictators in the nations who are not submitted to Christ. Uh, it might even be the bosses of businesses um, or even middle managers. Uh, they lord it over people. The, the, the ones in places of power, Jesus says, he, they make other people serve them. But Jesus says that to be great in his kingdom, to have a, a high position in his kingdom, is to become like a servant. The one who is first and greatest in the kingdom is the one who serves. It's the one who becomes the most servant hearted it's the one who embraces servanthood to the greatest measure why because says jesus i am among you as the one who serves the head of the church the king of heaven is among us as one who serves so it follows that to be truly apostolic to embody what is called the highest of the spiritual gifts you have to become a servant to all the english word servant in the Bible, uh, better translates as bond servant. Okay, it's not a, a word we would use today, but if you go back into the Greek and you look at what bond servant is in the Greek, that literally translates to mean slave. And that's why we don't like the word because the word slave has bad connotations and we don't like to use it, but that's essentially what it means. It's one who has no rights of their own, but lives solely for the will of their master. Their own life has been lost and they are bound to do the will of their master. 
Now, if that's the case, if we're slaves for Christ, let's think about what it means to have an apostolic mindset in the church. What are the implications for being part of the church with an apostolic mindset where being a slave to Christ qualifies you to be an apostle? Where being a slave of Christ is what enables you to live out that apostolic calling faithfully? Well, here's a few things. It means you're going to have to think very differently to how many church congregants think. Because many people think of the church in terms of what they can get. They think of the church in terms of what is this church going to offer me? They do that because they think of themselves as existing externally to the church and the church being an organization that is there to serve them. And they pick which church they attend based on what that church will offer them. They don't think of themselves as servants certainly not as slaves to Christ, they think of themselves as a consumer. They wouldn't say that, they wouldn't verbalise that, but the way they look at church and think about the church tells you that that is what is going on. Thinking of themselves not as a contributor, first of all, not what can I give, but what can I get as a, as a consumer. That is a curse of our materialistic, consumeristic age, and it is coming to the church in a very strong way, so strongly that many people don't even realise it's there. They don't realise they're trapped in it or functioning in it. But we can't afford to let that mindset get a grip of us. That mindset cannot exist in an apostolic movement. It'll quickly be frustrated and it'll flee. And that's largely because the apostolic is not focused on comfort or on convenience. As you'll see in Paul's life, you have to be willing to deal with discomfort, with lack and with simplicity. Uh, quite a lot. Uh, you're keeping the main thing the main thing and you're indifferent to the trappings of modern life. You don't really care for professionalism in the church. That doesn't bother you. Many churchgoers today can't deal with that because they look at the church through the lens of what they see in the world and they desire the church to embody what they see in the world. Secondly, as a servant, as a slave to Christ, you have to be willing to go wherever there is a need for you to go. You know, it's it's very easy, and I hear people saying this all the time, it's very easy to say, I'll go wherever God calls me to go, and all I want to do is go, go where God calls me to, do, to go. That's easy if discerning the calling of God on your life for where you're to be is only down to your own subjective view of what God is saying. It's amazing to me the amount of people who say they'll go wherever God calls them and then God calls them to some lovely tropical place or somewhere that's full of Christians or somewhere that's full of benefactors. But to say, I'll go wherever I'm needed in the body is a better way to discern God's calling, in my opinion. And that means being open to change, which is something that many saints resist. But look at the life of Paul, which was a life of constant change, constant upheaval, because he lived to serve the church. He lived to go where he was needed to minister to the people of God. That is how he largely discerned where he was supposed to go yes one or time one or two times he got a vision but more often than not he was yearning to go to places because he knew that the church needed him and his ministry and he labored for their growth in jesus he suffered lack and he suffered discomfort for the sake of their growth in the lord he wasn't looking at a church saying i'd like to go and visit that church because what that church can give to me he was looking to go there and visit that church and be with that church and minister to that church because of his heart for them to know Jesus and to become like Jesus. His view of himself as a slave to Christ is what enabled Paul to be apostolic. We have to ask ourselves this, do we really see ourselves as slaves to Jesus, totally under the master's will, willing to think of our calling in terms of serving the needs of others, serving the needs of the body rather than serving our own sense of personal fulfillment through ministry because honestly friends for so many people their ministry is about them fulfilling a sense of personal calling a sense of personal fulfillment it's not about being a slave to jesus it's not about the maturing of the body it's about me fulfilling my ministry 
Paul certainly didn't think that way. And to be apostolic, you need to cast off that kind of mindset. You're a slave to Jesus to serve him and the church. Thirdly, to be a servant of Jesus is to serve his people. Yes, but it's also to serve his glory. Uh, a big problem for Paul that he faced in his ministry was the opposite to the issue he had of people discrediting him. It was people exalting him. He had that issue in Corinth where many identified themselves not as followers of Jesus, but as followers of Paul. And you know, Paul would tear his hair out about that. You can tell through his letters. He made the case to them that he didn't die for them, that even he was glad that he didn't baptize many of them, that he didn't want them for a second to find their identity as being as a follower of him or as a follower, we might say, of the church that he planted uh, that might seek to bear his name. He was only interested in them being followers of Christ. And in that way, Paul was a slave of the Lord Jesus. He didn't care a jot for his own reputation for the exaltation of his name. He lived and ministered to the glory of Christ. That is truly apostolic. Many so-called apostles today are all too keen for their name to be up in lights. And hey, woe betide anyone who writes their name on a conference flyer without the designation of apostle before it. Let me be really clear. Anyone who is concerned about their title, whether it's apostolic, reverend, pastor, evangelist or anything else is not apostolic in their mindset because concern for one's own reputation and fame goes directly against the nature of being apostolic. Uh, last week I shared some scriptures that often get taken out of context. Uh, some people came back to me this week and they said they, they enjoyed that, they enjoyed seeing the true context of those scriptures. I'll share with you another one this week, uh, which isn't so much taken out of context of the letter, uh, but which usually isn't transmitted in its fullness. And that's not good either. And it's uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 5, which you might know as saying this. Paul writes, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Maybe you've heard that. You'll find that in a lot of older churches, especially older Protestant churches, you find that one kind of written above the pulpit. For for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but uh, Christ Jesus as Lord. Or you'll see it as on, on kind of material banners hanging down around the church building. However, that is not the full verse. And it's, it's I've never seen the full verse put on one of those banners or, or even really proclaimed or taught. The full verse also includes these words on the end. It says, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So Paul says at the beginning, us apostles don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. So he's saying, look, we're not saying that we are Lord. We're not saying we're in charge. We're saying Jesus is Lord. He's in charge. Never for a moment would we profess to have lordship over you. Jesus is your Lord. We don't lord it over you. But then he says, what they do proclaim about themselves, because there is something about themselves that they do proclaim. They proclaim themselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And Paul did this repeatedly. Repeatedly, he proclaimed himself as a servant for the sake of Jesus. Not only in the letter to the Romans, but in many of his letters, he began by reminding the people that he was a servant to them and to Jesus. In his letters, he reminded them that Jesus is Lord and he is their servant. Why did Paul keep doing that? Why did he constantly kind of beat that drum? Jesus, Lord, I'm your servant. Why didn't he just say Jesus is Lord? But, but why did he keep saying I'm your servant? Because it is the default of people to make a man their God. Israel had that issue. God was their king. He'd shown himself to be their king. But they demanded an earthly king. They weren't satisfied without somebody on earth as their king. The early church had, had that issue. Jesus was their Lord. But after Jesus was risen and he wasn't with them anymore, they wanted to make Paul or Peter or Apollos their Lord. If you're apostolic, you get attention. And that can be a snare. It's become a snare to so many leaders in the church recently. Well-known leaders who've succumbed to the attention. 
behaving with pride or heavy handedness or sexual immorality or mixture of the three and new names who've fallen in these ways are coming out almost every week we've had another big big name this week who's come out who we would likely view as being apostolic who influences many churches around america and it's come out that he's fallen another one to add to the list uh, the, the the i was saying the other day to other leaders in our church there is an epidemic of leaders who have fallen in the last 12 months uh, and I think I've said this on the teachings before, if, if, if a couple of years ago you'd have listed the most influential um, apostolic leaders in the body of Christ, in Protestantism, in, in evangelicalism, the vast majority of them now have fallen. The Lord is purging the church. This is not a coincidence. He's purging and he's looking to raise up genuine and sincere apostolic movements which at their heart are fueled through genuine servanthood through those who continually stand against being made much of and persevere in pointing people away from themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the culture that he wants in our church. It's the culture he wants at the Gateway Church, but it's the culture he wants across the whole body of Christ. For too long, people have clamoured after the designation of apostleship without understanding what it means or embodying what it means. Listen, we are not immune to falling. I'm not immune to falling by any means. We are no better than anyone else. I'm no better than anybody else. I know what I'm truly like. I, I know who I am before God and I'm no better than anybody else. God is calling us though to something apostolic as a church. Prophetically, he's led us that way without doubt over the years and he's opening doors for us to do that what is so important at this juncture is that we understand the implications of that calling if you're part of the church you must understand that we have to continually think of ourselves and view ourselves as servants of jesus as slaves to christ given over to his will not thinking of ourselves, but thinking of others. Not seeking comfort and convenience, but willing to embrace change and challenges for the sake of his name, for the sake of his glory. That we would desire that he would get the reward of his sufferings and his name would be glorified in places where there is not currently worship ascending to the throne of God. Not basking in the intention and the attention that our calling may bring. Listen, if we if we do plant churches and multiply churches, that will get attention. We can't bask in that. We have to continually point people away from ourselves and point them towards the beauty of Jesus because his name is the only name that is worth marvelling at, honestly. Let's pray that we live this out faithfully so the Lord can then entrust us with a greater measure of responsibility as we journey forward together as servants of all, as, as slaves of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his church, as an apostolic community called and committed to do the will of our master, called to do the will of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word which teaches us and admonishes us and corrects us and rebukes us and you know, we seek to be submitted under your word in all things father forgive us for when we've not been submitted under your word under the lord jesus christ but we've sought our own will uh, for the times we may have sought our own fame and glory for the times where we've thought of ourselves first and foremost as consumers and recipients uh, father people who should be served and not as servants jesus you've served us in the ultimate way and through your love and through your servanthood you empower us to serve you and to serve others help us be faithful lord in the calling on our lives on the calling on our community lord you you've opened the door for us uh, you've given us a grace to break ground for your kingdom and go to places where the church doesn't exist. 
Lord, our heart is that you would receive the reward of your sufferings, that you would receive a church that belongs to you wholeheartedly. I pray, Lord, for myself, for um, the whole church, especially for those who have responsibility in the church, uh, that, Lord, we would think of ourselves in the right way, that we would be submitted and su submitted and surrendered to you to do your will, that we would be willing to labour whether we're seen or we're not seen, whether we receive um, an earthly reward or we don't, that that would be indifferent to us. Um, but we would serve out of the love you've given to us and we would serve for your glory. Help us embrace, Lord, the, the apostolic calling on our lives. Help us understand what it means. Help us walk in it and deliver us from every temptation that might fall at our feet. Lord, that you might be pleased with your church, that your church might be without spot or blemish, ready, Lord, to be presented to you in mature love, given over to your will. Lord, as we think about this in more depth over the coming month, minister to us, speak to us, create a right spirit within us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hope that's been helpful. Do discuss it in your households as you gather together. Seek the Lord together. Seek the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Be open to him speaking into your life. Confess sin. Encourage one another. Exhort one another towards good works. And keep pressing on in the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you. See you soon. Bye-bye.